Welcome to episode 8 of the Knitting Traditions Podcast. My name is Inga and you can find me on Instagram as Knitting Traditions and on Ravelry as Knitting Tradition. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. Episode 8, two months already and it's taken off. I'm so happy to have you back and I hope that you will enjoy this episode as well. If you're a new viewer, welcome! This is mainly a knitting podcast where I show what I've been knitting on and what I finished and maybe what I'm planning on if I have some yarn acquisitions. And in today's episode I will also be introducing a knit along. So first thing first. I am wearing a very warm sweater, oops, belly, <laughs> it's my day off today, so I'm wearing yoga pants because I was on call for the entire weekend. I work as a doctor in a family doctor's office for the next four months now and uh, we're on call from Friday morning until Monday morning, so I just got back home and I'm recording in daylight and the hence the yoga pants and knitted sweater. So, uh, some of you might have seen this pattern before. It's the um, honeycomb sweater by Andrea Maori. It has these lovely honeycomb stitches on the yoke and I think I knitted this sweater slightly different from the pattern. It's supposed to be oversized and I didn't want the oversized fit. So I think I changed it to be fitted and it's fitted on the sleeves. And I think I made it a little bit shorter. I don't know, maybe I ran out of yarn. <laughs> I don't know. But it's like a nice bracelet length and the body is cropped. Let's see if I can stand up. You can see with my lovely yoga pants. It's a cropped sweater and the yoke is also on the back. And I knit this um, in, not this color, but the yarn is called Wool Local. And this yarn I bought in London. Um, I think I got it from the something something herbidashery. Uh, they mostly sell fabrics and I did get some fabrics from there. Um, but they also had this yarn, which I really liked. Uh, it's Wool Local uh, by Erica Knight, made in England. It's 100 grams of uh, an intimate blend of pure British blue-faced Leicester Lysh Lysh and fine masham. So this is 100% wool and it's not super wash, which I love. And it's very soft. For being a rustic non superwash wool, this is very soft. I am wearing this uh, with nothing underneath, oh, except the bra, so it's right on my skin and it's not itchy to me, um, even though it's, you know, if you wear wools that are skin tight and they are slightly prickly, you'll feel it more than with a baggy sweater, but this one I can wear just fine, maybe just a tiny bit of prickling right here, which is where I'm very sensitive. <sighs> and it's really warm. Um, it has peeled a little bit, as you can see. I've worn it uh, several times and I haven't um, used a pill remover. I think that uh, after removing the pills, oh sorry, a few times, I think uh, it will stop pilling and it will be a really nice, warm, thin, 
wool sweater with a, a nice detail. Um, so yes, that's what I'm wearing. I don't remember how many skeins or what the color was, but I think I maybe used three skeins for this. Because one skein is uh, 450 meters um, or 492 yards. So it has a very high meterage. So I think, yeah, I think maybe I used three skeins for this cropped version. I do have a tendency to make a lot of my sweaters cropped because one, cheaper, two, faster, <laughs> and three, I do really enjoy the look of cropped sweater with uh, some high-waisted jeans. Um, I know a lot of people enjoy wearing their sweaters on outside their um, dresses and skirts and then a cropped one is really nice because it stops maybe at your waist and accentuates you know the flattering shape if you are going for the hourglass shape so yeah really happy with this one um i think it's gonna get a lot of wear now that it's getting colder outside because it is really warm even though it's thin yeah and um, I have some finished garments to show you guys. I managed to finish the um, balloon sweater by Petite Knit. And now of course it's wrinkly because I put it in my, uh, in my pack. I have this lovely basket that I bought uh, at a market in Tanzania when I was there for volunteer work. Um, we went to a market that sold lots of um, souvenirs of course, uh, arts and crafts, uh, a lot of these beautiful baskets and they also had some nice statues and um, this is quite big. They had several ones that were a lot bigger and it has these straps. I think they're fall leather. Uh, leather. They don't feel like genuine leather to me but this bag is really nice and sturdy uh, I had to squeeze it to get it into my suitcase but I got it home it spent a few days in the freezer along with the rest of my items to prevent uh, bugs and stuff which I from now on you know I'm always doing it when I'm traveling abroad because you never know um, what kind of bugs are in the rooms where you stay, if it's a hotel or a house or whatever. So this one I keep um, projects in or yarn in depending on uh, what I have on the needles. And today it's been holding the balloon sweater by Petit Knits. I digressed. <laughs> so this sweater um, I made slightly cropped. Um, it has the balloon sleeves. The big ones uh, with cinched in and long um, cuffs has a very beautiful shoulder detail as in the pattern that goes down and then into the arm and I knit this in Isaya spinny tweed together with Hasagawa silk mohair I showed the yarn in previous episodes I did not oh no I did bring it you know, I just freestyle these episodes, so you know, you never know what I'm gonna find. <laughs> the Hasagawa Silk Mohair, beautiful, beautiful soft one in like a wheat color. This is the fourth skein or ball, so I used three and a half, not even, and I even tried picking up the edging to knit it longer, and I knit it twice as long. And in the end, I just thought, you know what, I need to bind off. This can't go on forever. So I do have some leftovers, but I'm thinking these will be nice to maybe put in a scrap blanket or a color work project. Sometimes you find projects that uses just a little bit of mohair. So I will keep it in my stash for future inspiration. The other yarn is the Isaya Spinny Tweed which is a lovely, um, well, it's not really plied. What do you call it when it's not plied with another yarn? Single spun? No. Well, 
it's one strand it's not plied with another strand <laughs> it's uh, Danish yarn and wool uh, very thin yarn um, together I would say they made a fingering weight um, to a sport weight yarn and um, I I knitted first I knitted it uh, maybe to this length and I tried it on and um, it was quite cinched in at the ribbing you know how it tends to do when you knit and purl it gets well it gets cinched in compared to the the stockinette fabric and I just didn't like the way it felt because it was um, zero ease at the best then it was loose and then it was zero ease again and it was just a little bit too cropped um, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to block it out and when you knit with mohair ripping back is extremely difficult even more so if you've washed and blocked your knitwear so I decided to play it safe pick up and I was going to try and rip back and knit the stockinette part longer but there was no chance um, every single stitch had to have like some surgery to release it from the next this mohair uh, was really really difficult to rip back um, I don't recommend doing it there is a trick of putting it in your freezer and then doing it because then the fibers break more easily um, but I still didn't want to do that whole process so I spent 30 minutes just ripping back the bind off row and then I just uh, continued knitting in the established rib border and I don't think you can see where I ripped back and picked up again so it was quite forgiving even though I struggled a lot um, ripping back and now um, I'm not going to show you in this episode because it's too hot, but I'll wear it in a future episode. But the length now is like this. So it's still cropped-ish, um, I think. But I managed to block out the, the ribbon quite a lot. So it's like a straight fit, which I think will be nice and flattering. It softened up nicely. I left it in a... Um, in the... Yeah, a tub of yeah, a tub of lukewarm water with a special wool soak soap um, overnight, and then I laid it flat to dry the next day. You could also put it in your washing machine on like a high centrifuge to um, get rid of some of the water. But I I do wash a lot of my wools in the washing machine on a wool program, but. The first time I wash it, I like to do it by hand so that I know for sure that I'm in control and I get to wear it at least several times before putting it in the washing machine because I did have an accident once where um, it shrunk. I could still wear it, it didn't shrink a lot, but more than to my liking. Oh, I'm eating fiber again. So, bam. I, uh, I wash it by hand the first time and then I will dare to use the washing machine later on once I've used it a little bit because it's sad if you spend a lot of hours and then it shrinks that's just sad so I, I try to make sure that I get to wear it at least a few times yes and um, I forgot to show you in the last episode because I redid it and then I didn't um, make sure I had everything with me, but I finished <laughs> putting the nose on my little crocheted Cocker Spaniel. So he is finished now, and um, this was a crochet kit by Toft. Um, they said the difficulty degree was two, so beginner friendly-ish. I have never really been a crocheter, so even I managed to do this, and that was fun. And um, in the spring I made this one. I went to Felda two weeks ago, and I picked this one up from my storage to bring here because I wanted to show you guys. Aren't they just the cutest? This one's name is Simon the Sheep, 
I don't remember this one's name, but it's um, something something Cocker Spaniel. I'll put it uh, down below in the description box together with pattern names, fiber that I've used, etc. And if you've never found the description box before, because somebody did ask me and I did wonder about this myself, at least when you're on your phone, underneath the video, there's the title of the video. It's if you click on that, the description box opens. Yes, so I have two crocheted animals for me. <laughs> uh, these I'm keeping um, for the future, either to give away or to keep for my own family, we'll see. But right now, they're just too cute. So these ones are staying with me for now. All right, and I have, I've not been working on the cabled sweater this week. I needed another <laughs> break from it. I guess I'll probably be knitting on it bi-weekly if I'm uh, lucky. I need to have a day with a lot of time to kind of get into the flow of the cabling and uh, having the mindset to do so. But I did finish some other projects. Um, I've been working on this pattern and I finally blocked this one up. It's now finished. So this is a cowl. Um, it's been test knit. It's um, knitted in two yarns. Uh, this is BC Garn, uh, Danish yarn. It's called Shetlands Uld. It's 450 meters. Uh, per 100 grams and it's a two-ply yarn uh, very fine uh, rustic non superwash and it's held <clears throat> with this one for the background color which is the cow knee uh, which is 400 meters per 100 grams so it's also a very thin two-ply yarn but slightly thicker than the BC Shetland Sul. And this one is the color ED, very fancy names. So together, these two made um, this one, and it's 30 centimeters by, I think, 20 high. And it's nice to wear when it's chilly outside. It stands up on its own. And well, with my hair down, it kind of pulls it down a little bit, but I like the cows to be able to stand like this so I can kind of hide my face in it. If I'm walking outside and it's a chilly wind and cold, then, then this will kind of keep the heat around my lower face and ears. Whew, hot. Um, but with this this sample, um, there isn't that high of a contrast between the gray and the lighter uh, tone of the uh, Kaoni effect yarn. So I wanted to make another sample um, whew, where I know there would be high enough contrast. And um, a lot of the people who are testing this have knitted with different rustic yarns because the pattern is made for rustic yarns but you could um, use different thicknesses uh, ranging from a light fingering to a sport thin DK. Um, this uh, sample is knit with uh, Finul by Rauma. Uh, so these two. So it's called Finul by Rauma. It's a Norwegian rustic yarn. They come in 50 gram balls. Um, I think they're affordable. They're between four and five US dollars. And I know that they are sold by stores both in Canada and the US. Um, Espace Tricot in Canada for sure, and the Woolly Thistle in the US. And also you could buy directly from Rauma, I think. And there's also other online stores that will ship it to you in Europe per se or other places. This heathered uh, brownish red color is the color 4132 and it's um, 
175 meters in this ball, which means 100 grams would be 350. So these two swatches are knit exactly the same on the same needle and they have the same width. Um, but this one was knit with uh, up to 450 meters per hundred, while well, this is 350 meters per hundred, so the thickness is, in my opinion, different. This is way thicker than this one, uh, or way thicker than the... Um, I lost it. Thicker than the BC Garn Shetland so It's a hundred meters difference, which I think is quite a bit. Um, when it comes to the height of the cowl, the fetal one is, uh, let's see, yeah, it's like a few rows longer, um, but I also think I knit an extra, um, no I didn't, no, they're knit exactly the same, the difference is just that um, when you knit with thicker yarns uh, on the same needle, like in this case, the the gauge uh, width was the same, but the row gauge might vary because it's a thicker yarn, so it might build a little bit more in height. So I was contemplating maybe um, felting this one. It is really warm already, having just washed it. Uh, this one also stands up on its own. Uh, I think this is... A lot due to uh, it being a rustic yarn. Rustic yarns are more toothy, they stick to each other, they're not as floppy as let's say uh, merinos or superwash yarns. And um, oh, it's really warm. <laughs> I might felt it uh, that would probably decrease the height by let's say so and maybe the width a little bit but that's okay to have it tighter as well. It's, it's mostly just about preference. So if I was to felt it, I'll probably do it by hand underwater and just rub it together until it's uh, a little bit more felted. It will make it windproof, but yeah. So I'm really happy with this. I might be knitting up a few more to give away for Christmas because I did get some other uh, phenol colors, so we'll see. And uh, I think I'll include the pattern with um, these two in the Rustic Cal giveaway. Um, yes, but first let's finish the works in progress. Let's not digress too much yet. And I showed this last time, uh, I used a magnetic board for holding the pattern. I found that it made it a lot easier and faster to do color work, so I highly recommend that. You could also just print out whatever color work chart you have and then put a post-it under the line or highlight the ones you're done with. That will um, make it easier to keep track of what row you're on. And another project that I forgot to bring last time, I've made some progress on my mohair sweater. Let's loosen it up, it's been in the bag. <laughs> I've kept this one in this lovely tote from Beautiful Knitters, which I got when I went to her store in London last year. Beautiful store. And uh, it's been holding this. So this is the Winter sweater by Moharia. She um, has made this pattern herself um, and I've gotten I finished the body and the neckline uh, I did have to rip back the neckline and do it again with a f um, with fewer stitches than the pattern said because my neckline got kind of floppy like it stood out instead of aligning nicely so that's a modification I did for my preference it might just be the way that I knit um, and I've got the sleeves to go, but I think it'll be really fast because I'm going to knit them on smaller uh, circular needles so I can just knit in the round because at the top part of this one I have to knit back and forward 
because of the arms. And I didn't really enjoy uh, purling with color work. Um, somebody pointed out or asked me if I knitted continental purling or Norwegian purling. I have never seen continental purling. I thought what I was doing was just continental knitting and that was also purling. But apparently, continental purling, you hold the yarn in front of your work and you have to like push it. It does not seem to me to be very uh, uh, fast or convenient. So uh, with Norwegian purling, I'm always holding the yarn over my left finger and I don't have to move it at all in between knitting or purling. I just use my right hand to pick the stitches above or below, kind of. So that's how I knit. Norwegian purling, continental uh, knit stitch. Yes, so I got the sleeves left. I am loving this. It's so squishy and so soft. It's just lovely. I, um, I absolutely adore the gold in this. It's got like sparkly, sparkly gold, which I love. And um, the yarn is uh, a South African yarn. It's called African Expressions Love. So this is the yarn. And it's 78% mohair, 13% wool, 9% nylon. And it's gonna be so warm <laughs> and it's held together with this PT Concord yarn which is the sparkly effect yarn that you uh, in this sweater hold together with the golden yarn to make it nice gold sparkles so yes very excited to have this done and I picked uh, some colors for another version in more earthy tones without the blues which I might um, give away as a Christmas gift or keep. We'll see uh, which one I love the most. So yeah, really happy with how this is turning out. I can imagine wearing it outside on a snowy day with like a thin wool garment underneath and that's it. Yes, and um, I have been casting on another pair of socks because I have almost finished this pair um, these I cast on last time they have an afterthought heel um, which I used only the lighter colors for and then it's an uninterrupted striping yarn and then just toe with the um, when you sew in the stitches at the end. Kitchener, Kitchener stitch toe, yes. So one sock finished and the other one I have already um, put in a line for where I'm gonna pick up the afterthought heel so I just have to knit a little bit more in the round and then do the heel and toe. So this one will hopefully be finished soon so I cast on another pair of socks. Um, if you might have seen this color before, um, this is the Regia Premium yarn. Um, it's a merino yak yarn uh, by Schachenmeyer company. Uh, these are the leftovers from Into the Wood Socks that I made by Melody Hoffman or B Mandarins. And I envisioned pairing these for cuffs uh, heel and toe together with some other leftovers that I have from a hat that I made in the uh, Filcolana Arveta Classic. So I had this much left over so I wanted to pair them and make socks and then I'm, I haven't decided if I'm gonna make um, if I'm gonna make it uh, a plain vanilla sock with just stockinette stitches or if I will do some either lace work or pattern work. Um, after casting it on, Melody Hoffman actually updated her into the woods sock pattern 
to be able to knit the uh, little tree structures with a contrast color. So I really want to do that with these exact socks. I think it would be lovely to have those golden um, uh, trees on the white socks. I'm just not sure if I'll have enough yarn. So I think I will have to think a little bit more about that. And I'm holding both these sock projects inside this lovely drawstring bag uh, by the Urban uh, Stitcher. And it also has this lovely uh, cuff thing so you can have it on your arm and knit. I love to knit socks while I'm walking outside with my dog because it's kind of two-in-one kind of thing. I get to walk her and knit and enjoy nature and yeah, so this is perfect for that. She um, kindly gifted me this bag, um, this lovely, lovely tote in a waxed canvas in my color. It's beautiful, beautiful, um, beautifully made. I don't understand how people can stitch or sew so beautifully. Like how did she even do this little detail and like this color changing um, thread and it's the same on the inside. It's just so beautiful. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous bag. So I have these two from her and she was so kind to gift a bag for the knit along. Isn't this gorgeous, right? So um, this one is the kind of bag that stands up on its own on your table or on the floor. You can have like your project inside it. The Urban Stitcher is uh, run by Angie Moore. She lives in uh, West Sussex in the UK. I think the town was called Crawley. And this is a business run by her alone. She sews in a studio in her own home and she makes everything from small to larger bags so she said that these ones are really popular and i understand because i love them and i also really love this one because it fits larger projects and i am personally a huge sweater knitter so this one just sang to me and these ones are perfect for knitting at home and it has these lovely uh, kind of pockets inside where you can sort of put your needles and accessories and whatever you may need and it's quite large like you can fit a lot in here a sweater project for example or a shawl and um, it also has outside pockets on both sides which are really nice and these handles and this will be going into the prize package for the rustic knit along. So something to look forward to. And she also, most of her bags has either zippers or pull, like pull cord closures like this one. And I went to her store uh, when she sent this my way and she had some lovely, lovely fabrics. A lot of it is linen or quilting cotton, so you know that it's gonna be nice and sturdy. And she had this really, really cute one with uh, sheeps on it. So um, I hope she'll get that back in, uh, back in her store because I really want to buy one because they were beautiful. Yes. And in this lovely tote bag, I have a new cast on. I cast on um, the Melon Treya by Drople Design. It's my favorite sweater pattern in my favorite yarn in my favorite color. Uh, sadly, it's only in Norwegian for now, but I'm hoping she will translate it to English. It's a very simple top-down raglan, but I just really like the fit and the yarn. Uh, that goes with the pattern. Um, you see it has a rolled hem and then just raglan uh, stitch and I've just separated for the sleeves and the body and I was knitting like crazy this morning. I wanted to be able to separate it to show you guys on the podcast and I did and 
it's really lovely i do love this color the color is called cognac and one sweater in the size small uses three skeins of the tinde yarn from Hillesvag. So, yeah. so this is this is a nice representation of the color uh, very rust like a brownie orange cognac color so i've started the first skein and i have two left and I have made this sweater before, so this one is not for me. This one uh, is one that my landlady wanted to get or buy from me. Uh, I hope she'll be interested in doing a crafty swap instead. Because <laughs> I think it's so hard to put a price tag on knitting. Because one, okay, one thing is the, the cost of the yarn, right? But then the amount of hours that goes into knitting you can't really do an hourly pay <laughs> for that. That will be way expensive. So we'll see what happens. But yes, this is the one that I have knitted for myself. Uh, I put a little um, tag in the back that says handmade in fall leather, fall leather, fall leather, hard words. Uh, just to be able to easily see what's the back of the sweater. Um, it does have some German short rows to lift the back up, which is nice. Then you don't freeze as much in your back because, well, we're, we're have, we have longer backs than we have fronts, even with our busts usually. So that's why you do that. So it's a nice cropped sweater, um, long enough to stuff into the jeans. And it has um, also the rolled hem on the arms and you're supposed to um, flip them like this and have a cuff. And this one has a little bit of pills on it. This is three years old and I've been wearing this the most out of every um, sweater that I own. This is the one I've worn the most. I've slept in it while camping, uh, worn it for days in a row while out in the woods. And I've never, never used a pill remover on it. So I would say that this is not bad for three years of heavy use. And I wanted to show you guys today because one of the reasons that I love the fabric so much is because it blooms so nicely. So you see this one, you, you do have some fuzz, but once you wear it, it softens up so nicely and you get a lot more fuzziness to it. It's almost like mohair fuzz on the sweater and it's not that thick but it's so warm so that's why I've been sleeping with it while camping because I get really cold at night and with this sweater I felt like it gave me warmth instead of me just lying there freezing yes. and also this bag has uh, two large pockets on the inside, which is where I keep extra needles and stitch markers and such. And then two large on the outside as well. Beautiful bags. Go check her out. And yes, and the needles I'm using for Vellum Treya is my Licky needles this time. Uh, they use three and four millimeters and this one only goes down to 3.5. So I used some Knit Pro 3mm for the parts that needed it. Um, they use the same cord, so it's no problem changing between Licky Needles and Knit Pro and Cubics. Yes, all those have interchangeable cords. And I have to say, I do love knitting with the interchangeable cords. One of the main reasons for that is that you could put your sleeves on hold and they have like little stitch stoppers that you put at the at the cord and it just rests there and then you put the needles on it when you want to knit the sleeves later on so it's really great if you ask me I recommend and if you have an interchangeable needle set you don't need to have shorter cords and longer cords in the same needle size because you can just change between them 
So that's really great. And I think, yes, buying an interchangeable set is expensive, but if you add up the sum of getting all the different needle sizes in different lengths over time as you um, become more and more of a knitter and you need all the different types, it is cheaper to invest in the interchangeable needle set. Yes, so that was all of this week's um, knitting and finished objects. So I wanted to talk about the rustic knit along. There's just a little bit of tea. And that's already cold. I have this uh, beautiful um, cup that I got in Japan. It's not really a cup for drinking. It's more of a, it's a bowl for miso soup. I think it's what it's called, a Japanese soup. Um, but I enjoy knitting beverages from it. So I'm knitting a, no, I'm not knitting, I'm drinking a yogi tea with orange, ginger, and vanilla. Yes, so I went back and forward on how to do the knit along because, you know, there are different ways of doing it. My preferred way is Instagram because I find it a lot easier to see what you guys are knitting on on Instagram because you can just tag your photo with um, rustic knit along in one word small letters and then I get to see what you're making and so does everyone else who searches for that hashtag but um, I couldn't really find a way of drawing a winner from hashtags um, I would have to count how many photos have been tagged and then count a number from a number generator and that would be very difficult if this becomes um, more than a hundred uh, people participating <laughs> and then I was thinking okay maybe just drop a comment below here but then I wouldn't be able to see if you've actually participated because to be in the knit along you have to knit something right um, so I think what I'm gonna do is I will post a thread on Ravelry and I will put the link below it will be a finished garment thread, I think. And you can participate only with finished garments to win a prize. Um, I will make another chatter thread where you guys can talk together and post photos as you go and ask questions and discuss and just share in love. But there will be a specific thread that you can only enter finished garments and that's where I will draw the price from. Please don't comment on each other's um, posts in the finished thread because that will disrupt the, um, the... Everyone has one chance for finished garments and if you leave a comment uh, that will kind of disrupt the order of things. So one chatter thread, do whatever you want. A finished rustic knit along thread where the prizes will be drawn from. So that's the Ravelry bit. However, I'm a huge fan of Instagram as a platform for knitting inspirations. I have uh, the Knitting Traditions uh, account there and I only follow knitters and I scroll through beautiful things and I love following hashtags. So what I want is that if you use Instagram and you would like to participate in the Rustic Knit Along, do post in the Ravelry thread to win, but I would love to see what you guys are making. And to show that, uh, just put the hashtag under the post that you're posting with uh, Rustic Knit Along in one word, small letters, um, so that I can follow and see what you guys are making. And I was thinking if um, technology is on my side that I will um, post some of those photos on uh, at the end of um, the YouTube video, if that works. We'll see. And um, 
Yes. So, uh, if you want me to pay attention and see what you're making as you go or whatever you have made um, on Instagram, use that hashtag Rustic Knit Along. To win uh, the prizes for the cow, post your finished garments in the finished objects uh, thread on Ravelry. There's also a chatter thread if you want to just uh, blabber and talk and share and enjoy the cow. And the cow is a rustic knit along. That means that you uh, need to make something. It doesn't have, a, have to be a big garment. It can be something small, but it has to be in a rustic yarn. And by rustic yarn, I mean non-superwash and no plastic in the yarn. I know that some of you might not be living in a country where natural fibers are um, readily available in the form of animal fibers, but you will probably have access to plant fibers such as uh, linen, nettle, um, cotton, uh, yeah, different plant fibers. Um, and those can also be used in the rustic knit along as long as they are not superwash treated and have plastic in them. Uh, so either animal fibers or plant fibers um, is what you have to knit with and it can be bigger or smaller garments. That's up to you. Uh, I would love to see what you're making and if, um, if you don't think you'll be able to post a finished object in the Ravelry thread, uh, that's okay. You can just tag it on Instagram and share and participate in the cal either way. Um, but you have to finish an object to be eligible to win. And you can do more than one project. That's not a problem. You can participate as many times as you want with finished objects. And um, I think I will run this knit along until... Um, for now, let's say until the end of January. Uh, let me know if you think that's good because I think a lot of people might be busy now with knitting for Christmas. So that's why I want to have it for the end of January in case you want to knit something rustic for yourself and you don't have the time to cast on right now. And I'm very excited to see what you guys are knitting on. I am uh, really enjoying knitting on this right now. I um, Yeah, so that was everything about the cowl. If you have some questions, just pop it below. I will make those two threads on Ravelry and I'm gonna start already um, following the Rustic Knit Along hashtag on Instagram for inspiration. Yes, so um, I do enjoy knitting um, color work. I do enjoy knitting structure work but I need something in stock in that knit in the round in between because sometimes I want to just be able to knit and not have to think about what I'm doing. I don't have to be able, need to pay attention, reading a pattern. I just want to knit, knit, knit and use it as a sort of uh, mindless ritual to relax. And that's what this is for me. Um, this being one strand and um, stuck in that in the round, I don't really have to pay that much attention. I can just feel with my fingers what's going on and knit. So, uh, a lot of people wanted to hear a little bit more about Norway. So I figured I will oblige. Um, Norway is a long country with a lot of um, different dialects. People have been living far from each other for hundreds of years, which means that we speak differently. Um, you don't have to go far to change, uh, to hear a different dialect. Every city has its own and uh, you can kind of tell where people are from based on how they pronounce their words. 
and we have a lot of different dialects. Some of them are very difficult to understand, I think, if you're... I hope I don't make anyone angry with me, but my experience is that people from Oslo, which is the capital, have more difficulties understanding the other dialects than people living, let's say, on the west coast. Uh, I think that that's because on the west coast there are a lot of different dialects uh, not far away, while on the east coast where Oslo is, it's not that big of a difference between the dialects. So maybe here we're more used to hearing different dialects. Please don't hear me. Um, I guess you could compare the differences kind of like Scotland versus US dialects versus uh, London versus uh, Ireland, you know, these are different ways of pronouncing English words. We have the same just more than a hundred probably in Norway alone. Um, we're only around five million people so we are not that many but it's a very rich country um, we found oil and we've been living generously off on that um, a lot of the money from oil has gone into um, kind of a fund uh, by the state which is being saved up for future generations so that's really nice to have something to fall back on and um, most businesses in Norway are state-run. We have many parties to vote for. It's not just two. Uh, there's lots of them. And usually when one party wins the election, they form coalitions with one or two other parties. And then they kind of give and take from each other's um, poli politics. Um, so I feel that no matter who wins our election, there are not that big political differences. Um, so there's not huge changes, um, which is kind of nice. I feel like most Norwegians uh, agree uh, on the bigger issues. And then there are smaller issues um, that they're always kind of disagreeing on, but I haven't really felt um, huge changes with the uh, um, Prime Minister changing every four years. Um, education here is free. Uh, we have, we divide our school into first to seventh grade and then eighth to tenth grade and then from uh, after tenth grade you have three more years of gymnasium and you can apply for whichever school you would like to go to and you get in then based on your grades. Uh, they have different kinds of school then. It's either kind of um, general studies where you have a little bit of every class and you have sciences and that kind of thing. Or you can apply for um, the kind of school that prepares you for work. So you have um, construction work, hairdressers, uh, people that make jewelry, um, uh, arts and media. Dif yeah, they have different kinds of um, lines or what you would call it that you could go to for two years and then you go into internship and then you're done. If you go to the other school, which most people do, you have a little bit of every class and sciences and then after that you apply for a university to go to extended studies of some sort before applying for jobs. And I really think that the school system here is great. Um, it's free, there's not that big of a class difference in Norway. Um, it's very evened out by taxes, higher taxes for richer incomes and then lower taxes for lower and the fact that school is free, education is free, healthcare is free after you've paid I think $200 a year then whatever else comes is free. Um, dental care is not free which is not so nice. <laughs> so it's nice and even. Uh, 
people have a lot of the same possibilities. Um, of course, if you live in a large city, there's a lot of options. If you live in a smaller town, you might have to travel to go to school. Where I live now, they only have up until 10th grade. So after 10th grade, the kids have to go to a neighboring city to finish their studies. Also, if you uh, study abroad, the Norwegian government uh, will give you uh, loans for tuition and to live. Uh, these you pay back after you finish your studies and if you do well and finish all your exams, parts of the loan is converted into uh, scholarships. There are very low interest rates on these loans and um, they're really good loans to have if you need to have loans because they're very affordable to live with and I think you have like 25 years to pay them back or something and if you lose your job or you don't get a job you can pause them and then they start up again once you get a job so that makes it easy for people to get the education that they want to get uh, Norwegian kids uh, at least when I grew up <laughs> played a lot outdoors and even in primary school we did have a lot of focus on being outside uh, gym gym classes which were at least twice a week if not more were usually outdoors even our arts and crafts we would go outdoors to find different materials from nature to use in our classes um, school buses for primary school not really a thing you would have to live quite far away uh, in order to get a school bus so Norwegian kids uh, walk to school or they bike. Um, I think in the first grade, maybe the parents will walk with them for the first days or weeks just to make sure the kids um, know their way to school and back from school. But after that, they usually just get to school on their own and they get home on their own. And then there are uh, lots of sport activities, music activities, uh, that kids can participate to. These are not run by the schools. Um, so these are run by sport clubs and other people. And kids usually participate in these activities after school. So they would go home and then they would go to either swimming or football or uh, piano lessons, band, whatever they're interested in. And um, even though it's a rich country today, it didn't used to be. And I would say that knitting is a huge part of the Norwegian culture. You can find knitwear on people wherever you go. I, I've started to notice that if I take the ferry, I'll see at least one person wearing a traditional kofta, which is a sweater with color work pattern. And most grandmas knows how to knit. I think my parents' generation, um, it was less popular. That's kind of when it got started to become more fast fashion. You could buy clothes. You didn't have to make them yourself with your sewing or knitting. Uh, but I think it's picking up again now in my generation, like a trend of uh, focusing on slow fashion and knitting and uh, making things yourself when everything around us is kind of going at a high speed it's nice to slow down and make something yourself wherever whichever food store you go to here of the like larger brands they carry uh, yarn and knitting needles and patterns um, you can find it in almost every grocery store there's also usually at least a knitting store in every town even this place, which is on the west coast of Norway, far into the fjords, where there's there's around 2,600 people here, there is a yarn store, and there are two food stores, and both of them carry yarn. So it's, it's quite popular. Uh, we learn to knit in school. Uh, not everyone continues, of course, and a lot of people have picked it up um, as they get older and start having kids themselves but it's 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 a huge part of our culture I would say and there's a lot of traditional patterns um, I've talked about the cell group patterns before 
I used to get selva mittens from my grandma for Christmas and she would also make socks. Um, her mother used to make all the clothes for her and my grandma used to uh, knit and sew all the clothes for my father and his three brothers. My father now never wears <laughs> knitwear. <laughs> maybe he got too much of it. So maybe my kids in the future, I don't have any now, but maybe if I do the same, they will not be wearing it as adults either. So we'll see. But I think there's a lot softer yarns today than what it was uh, 60 years ago. There's uh, a lot of more commercial yarns that focuses on it being soft and smooth and pretty. Whereas I think before it was more whatever you could get your hands on that maybe the farmer next door had spun up. And uh, it was more about being functional and warm rather than uh, comfortable. I hope that you will participate in the knit along, uh, not have a focus on uh, winning. Um, the prize of course will be beautiful with the bag from the Urban Stitcher and a pattern, some yarn, maybe some other goodness will come my way and I will share with you in future episodes, but uh, participating is what counts. I would love to see what yarns people find and what they make with it because inspiration is everything. I hope you're doing well. I hope that you'll have a wonderful week, that you will find some time to sit back, relax, and knit for a bit, and that you get to enjoy something special this week, something that makes you happy. And I will continue knitting on this sweater and maybe some cables. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.